Owning a pet is usually for life, but what happens when you're no longer able to? In 2018, 19,235 cats were reported abandoned in the United Kingdom, which is absolutely scandalous and heartbreaking. Fortunately, there are several organizations that are dedicated to both rescuing and rehoming these poor neglected felines. Notably, the Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue Center, which is both local and bespoke, and also the nationwide and historical Royal Society for the Protection and Cruelty to Animals. Cindy, how many um, cats have you got in your cattery at the moment? 14. The Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue Centre has been rehoming unwanted cats and kittens for over 25 years. We have constantly got a list of cats waiting to come in. Never had a book empty, ever. This cattery is 25 years old. But you know, it's warm, it's fine for now, it's dry. We started the Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue in 94. And I moved here and I decided to go foster for Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue. And I knew Marjorie Nash because she was part of the RSPCA at the time, but she branched out and started her own charity up. Um, well, basically we take in cats that for some reason or other people can't keep any longer. So, so yeah, it's, uh, we're a registered charity and uh, we're just all trustees. We actually did belong, or we had membership with one of the bigger charities. So what is the Royal Society for the Protection and Cruelty to Animals, or abbreviated the RSPCA? Well, it's the largest animal charity in the United Kingdom. They rescue 100,000 animals every year, have 162 branches nationwide, and they employ about 2,000 people. So all of the cats that you see in here have come into the RSPCA because they've been found sick, injured, lost or abandoned out on the streets of London. Uh, this ward is currently three quarters full. We have on estimate about 21,000, I think it was 20,816 abandoned cat calls in 2018 alone. Um, and we rehome over 25,000 cats every year. I first started with the RSPCA, that was the advert that I answered, and they bought me a three cat cattery round to the house and put it up. I imagined that it would just be the odd cat now and again, but about a week after the building had been put up, an RSPCA inspector came knocking at the door with three cats, so that filled up the pen. From that day till now, which is nearly 30 years, I have never been without a full cattery. But we are very, very busy. We've always got cats waiting to come in. Probably 200, 250 a year between Cindy and I, we rehome kittens and adult cats. I don't know, I've got a real bond with cats. It may be from my childhood, we just had cats in our family all the time. I treated them like, like babies, I suppose, and it's, it's just something I've never grown out of. I love them. Because we're better known locally now, we, we tend to get calls for all sorts of things and emergencies which sometimes we have to pass on to other people. So what makes a person want to become involved with animal rescue? People from all walks of life take up the charge. I've always had cats in my life, even as a child. I didn't have dolls. I had cats in prams, <laughs> dressed in nappies, I believe. 
I've worked for the RSPCA for 16 years. Um, I was not working in animal welfare before that. I was charter surveyor before I joined the RSPCA, but I was involved with some voluntary work which made me come across RSPCA inspectors and I thought, yeah, do you know what, that's, that's a job that I'd like to do. It's a job a bit more worthwhile maybe than what I was doing previously and I thought I could make a change and make a difference. And then I went on to breed Abyssinians, which is a beautiful breed. I just thought, you know, we are breeding these beautiful pedigrees, but there's so many unwanted domestic cats out there that really, really need home. So I decided it was a bit of a decision to make that I wouldn't breed anymore with the cats. My husband already had built one of the catteries for the Abyssinians, which wasn't being used anymore. Um, and that's when I phoned the RSPCA up and said, you know, I have this cattery if ever you want to use it. And that's how it all started, that I was taking RSPCA cats in at the time. And then, of course, obviously, when we branched out to Marjorie Nash. That's why I started doing it, because I like cats and I wanted to help. But obviously, it's, it's ballooned into much more than I ever thought it would to begin with. Has he had breakfast? I take it he has. Oh, yes. In fact, he's just had a little something to eat now, so I know he's got a full tummy. Oh, bless him. Uh, so he's got a good appetite. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, hello George. Okie dokie, let's get him in. My name's Penny, I'm local, I live in Amersham and uh, I've, my circumstances have now changed whereas uh, where I leave the country quite a lot and my poor George gets quite distressed when I go away and it's not fair on him anymore. Uh, I've had him for five years and it's very, very difficult, but I have to do the best thing for him. I discussed uh, what I was thinking of doing with, with my vet, and she said, Marjorie Nash is the place to go to. And uh, I had already met Cindy. I knew about Cindy because cat uh, my cat had boarded here for one weekend when, I, when the whole family was away, so nobody was, could look after him and uh, he came home happy from her, so I, and she's a lovely lady. And I was told that they never ever put a well cat down, so that was a great comfort. I know she'll find him a good home. What's he like with children? Well, Not that he tends to go I away. mean, would he be okay with a family, perhaps with teenage children or oh, something yes. like that? Yeah, but, oh, not a happy bunny. No, he's not a happy bunny, come on. You've got to be nice to me because I've got to feed you. So I'll leave him for about half an hour, then I'll give him a little bit of food because I don't want to sort of worry him too much. Let him take it, let him get his smell around. So what I will ask you to do, dear, if you don't mind, just do the form for me. Yes. Riley, where you think you're going, young man? Hmm? I said I've got a, a new neighbour. Who's that? No, oh, he's a lovely cat. He's, he's lovely and he's... I think he's going to make somebody very happy. The elderly live for their pets, so it's really sad when they have to give them up because they're no longer able to look after themselves. You see, it's not just about companionship. A pet improves their state of mind, gives them something to focus on, and generally increases their exercise levels. Sad, actually, that People have to go into homes and they can't take their pets with them. And it's heartbreaking. It really, really is because maybe that's just a lady or a gentleman by itself and they've had that cat for many, many years. It's been their companion for years. Not only have they got to go into a home, they've got to leave their best friend. And that is sad, but unfortunately that's the way it is. But all we can say to them is we do our utmost to get them into a, a nice home again. Now, some people say that cats are very independent and therefore they don't need as much looking after or care as other pets, such as dogs. Yes, there is this thing about cats being very independent. I don't agree with it, quite honestly. Cats love company. They really, really do. They are one of the more abandoned animals because people think when they leave home, for example, or the circumstances change, they can just put the animal outside the front door, shut the front door, walk away, because the cat will look after itself. 
I mean, we do get people that phone up for cats or kittens and say, I'd want a lap cat. Now, hand on heart, I can't say to them when they come here, this cat is going to be a real lap cat. Sometimes you get cats in the cattery that are so friendly and loving, you think they're going to go into a different environment, they're going to be exactly the same. Do you know, it normally works a different way. They will settle eventually, but they go in a bit skittish and they, they don't really react to people straight away in a different environment. They take time. Yet another cat that could be quite shy, and you think, hmm, it's going to take time, they might walk into a different home, tail up, I've been here forever, this is my home. So you can't, you can't judge what a cat's going to do. People have to take that chance. People have got to realise that every cat is different and they will react differently. So sometimes owners make the sensible decision that they're not coping maybe, or their financial circumstances change, or their housing circumstances change for whatever reason and they'll call the RSPCA and ask if we can take their pet. We very, very rarely say no. We might ask people to wait while we find some space, but we, we don't say no generally. Lucy, for example, came into us, Lucy's 12. She came into us because her owner had had a bit of a population explosion at home, so obviously hadn't got adult cats neutered, and then cat population had got a little bit out of control and um, realised that actually, just too many of them at home, so they're not all getting enough food. It's so very expensive to feed one or two animals, let alone as many as this lady had. So once that person's contacted the RSPCA, an officer like myself will go out, assess the situation. The owner will be told that their animal will come into the care of the RSPCA. They'll be asked to sign some paperwork. That animal will then be our animal. So they will, it will be made clear to that person that actually um, they won't know where it goes. They won't know who it's been adopted by or fostered by. And that's really for the animal's sake as much as anything else. It's, we, it's distressing. You can't keep going and visiting a pet once you've relinquished it. That wouldn't be fair on the pet or the new owners, to be fair. The daily routine for animal rescue workers can be very emotional. I mean, in a single day, they can go from elation to despair. Of course, the day-to-day -day can also be fairly tedious at times. Yeah, a lady obviously is coming today with her cat. There's all different reasons why they give them up. Some are, to be honest, a little bit selfish, but there we go, I'm not going into that. We ask them to fill in uh, an acceptance form that they give him permission for us to take the cat. Because, not that it has happened yet, but what happens maybe if somebody brings a cat in, three weeks later they've decided they can't, they've got to have the cat back, and we've already homed it. As a charity, we could be in a lot of trouble. Once that's been done, and I've monitored that cat for behavior, is it litter trained, is it eating all right? Then if I'm a little bit worried, get it down to the vet, get it checked over. Once that's happened, one of the girls will probably put it on the website, the Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue, and then they will come make an appointment with us and come and obviously see, see the cats. And then we do a rehoming form if we're not quite sure of the area, we have a, we call a home checking girl that actually would just go to the road basically, they don't invade somebody's home or anything like that, just to see that it is okay. They do an adoption form and take the cat or kitten. Obviously we're here for them if there's any problems once the cat's been rehomed. We will take them back if for genuine reason that the cat hasn't settled, but we do say a good month because it is really stressful. Can you imagine, you know, they've had a home, then they've come into a cattery with all these other different cats, smells, very stressful. Then they go to another home, completely different environment altogether. Some cats go in with their tails up as if they've been there all, all, their, all their lives. Others will just hide underneath a bed or whatever. But yeah, we will take them back that, or, if we haven't got room, we will try and find another charity or whatever to take them in. But we won't sort of wash our hands of it. We're always there for them. Any problem, we, um, we don't lose touch. For all their differences, the process of rehoming a cat is very similar for both the RSPCA and the Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue Centre. First of all, if somebody telephoned in, we told them they'd have to go to a centre and have a look. 
and they'll go to a centre, they'll have a look. Usually the cat will choose them. People quite often go into a centre with a preconceived idea of what they want and choose something completely different. Um, we will then have one of our home checkers. So we have a number of um, ladies and gentlemen within the RSPCA that are specifically trained to come and home check. We'll go and home check. We're looking for things like if you're going to keep the cat in the garden, is the garden covered? Some people have special covers and netting over gardens. If you're going to let it outside, whether you live on a private road or a busy road or a main road, where your nearest vet is, where you would, how quickly it might take you to get there in an emergency. How much time you're at home, for example, more specifically with dogs, but cats are also quite people. You know, they like to be with people. They're not a pack animal like a dog, but you couldn't leave it on its own for hours and hours. So lots of things like that. Whether, the, whether we know the environment the cat came from previously. So if the cat came from a home, for example, where it was teased by children, we wouldn't put it in another home with children. Whether or not it gets on with dogs. We do have behaviourists at our centres that will try and ascertain those things if we don't know that about an animal. So we'll have a proper supervised environment where cats and dogs would come into not close contact but we might walk a dog past a cage over here just to see whether the cat responds and therefore it could go into a home with the dog for example. So all those things would be checked um, and then you could take the cat home and see how you get on with it. So that's basically what we, we, we do. Then we obviously do get the general public that have found cats or kittens in their garden, sheds, phone us up, ask for help. Can you take this cat? It's not ours, doesn't belong to neighbours. Sometimes they are from a home. Sometimes they are little strays, basically. Well, after we've, um, after I fed myself, then I normally go and feed all the cats and I clean them all out. The, I mean, the smaller bowl, probably I would put the cat milk in, right. which would be lactose free. Never give them milk with, you know, um, cow's milk because that would give them just horrible diarrhoea, so you don't do that. I sweep, wash the floor, do the litter trays, which normally takes between an hour and a half and two hours. Then it gets the nice, nice part of the day when you do the litter trays. It has to be done. In that time I can take three or four phone calls as well from the public wanting to adopt a cat, to give us a cat, for advice on cats. Basically, yes, that's it. And then if I'm not going out all day, the floor gets cleaned and just general disinfectant everywhere. Normally there's a visit to the vets three or four times a week. So from here, they're going to a home. Isn't that lovely? Oh, lovely. Yeah. That's really nice. So, uh, there might be people coming to the house to look at cats who are prospective adopters. Oh, room. Oh, We've got the little oh, tray. Yeah. Well, there's a litter tray in there, and I put some water and a few biscuits in. Do you want them to go in there to be? Well, there's upstairs as well. Oh right, okay. Well, I just let them go around, you know, yeah, when, yeah. when oh, Cindy's in. So the day sort of fills up mostly with cats, maybe a bit of shopping in between. <laughs> During that time, we have the phone going constantly for people that want cats or kittens, or just general inquiries or unfortunately people that got to bring their cats to be rehomed. And then in the evening it all starts again and at about between four and five o'clock I begin to feed them, put them all to bed, clean anything that needs cleaning and normally finish about six o'clock. And this is what we do. It's been going since 94. We are a really small charity but you know we are well known which is nice. It's quite difficult for me to go on holiday. It, has, it takes a lot of planning. Sometimes Cindy will come and do my cats. Sometimes I'll do Cindy's if she's going on holiday. But the busier we get, the more difficult it gets. The only thing we haven't really got, which would be brilliant, would be a fundraiser, you know, because um, we do survive on, obviously, donations that people give us, some legacies, which is very useful. Funding is absolutely crucial for these organizations they receive no state revenue so rely almost exclusively on donations and legacies well every cat we home we do ask the public for a donation 
um, which is normally about £65, but obviously if they're a pensioner and they, and they can't afford it, we'll just ask them for whatever they can afford, particularly if it's an older cat. And then people that know us might send us donations, like at Christmas we have an appeal and um, some of our followers will kindly send us money. Uh, but a legacy is something that somebody will leave in their will to us that knows of us. So this catchery was built two, two and a half years ago with a legacy from a lovely lady that left us some money, which we're very grateful for. Uh, it all helps. And because we've been going a long time, then people now know us and support us. We don't get any government finance right. at all. We are totally publicly funded. So we fundraise, um, as you quite rightly said, we do a lot of work with legacies. We also have a number of schemes, one of which is Home for Life. So if you have a pet, uh, you can sign up to the RSPCA's Home for Life where you know that when you pass away, um, your animal will be looked after. And we have quite a lot of people that do that. It's basically now donations from people. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we actually are 65 for a that when we're in that cat's rehomed a donation, which to be honest is nothing, mm -hmm. you know. Because well, they're, all, they're all vaccinated. They're all vaccinated. Vet checked, vet checked yeah. neutered if neutered, they need to be so treated yeah. for fleas and worms. So awesome. we spend far more than we get. Yeah. Get yeah. My name's Lucy, I work for Siva Animal Health. Um, we are a animal health care company. We manufacture animal medicine and animal welfare is at the forefront of everything that we do. And we're here today to present the cheque over to these guys um, for £1,163. Um, they are a chosen charity because we believe they do amazing work for rehoming cats and they're local to where we work. So, oh, thank you, you so much. That's so kind of you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, You're welcome. Brilliant. Thank you. So, no, the Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue are very, very grateful. So, thank you, all of you. Thank you. So, I myself am a massive cat lover. Um, I feel, to be honest, they're quite underrated. I think. Um, Obviously dogs, everyone wants a dog, um, and I feel cats are kind of left behind and, and I feel it's really sad the number of cats that are having to be rehomed um, and are giving up. Right. Okay, so this way girls. This is Josie. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah, she did have a home, a lovely home, but the uh, owner, this young guy, He's had four brain operations this year and he just couldn't keep her and he was heartbroken. She's been spayed and she's all up to date with jabs and things. Oh, she's quite a little tart. She's loves, <laughs> she loves everybody. I have a present each for you. Pretty time. Oh, Cindy, I've just home my mum. Oh, mind careful, careful. That's Polly. No, because we get her spayed. Yeah. And then, uh, all right, baby. We get her spayed and then she could go home. But she's been a wonderful mum. I've just found the line. I'm staying here. Yeah, we're not leaving now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be under my jumper, yeah. really. Yeah, I'm sure we had four. Yeah. <laughs> Come on then, that, that, that's um, Onji. Yeah, I feel cats are overlooked. Um, although dogs are companion animals, cats are just as much amazing companions. So they do everything that a dog it gives you, all the feelings that a dog could give to their owner. They, yeah, I think they're amazing. When we first set up the, the charity, it was hand to mouth and we had to think every time before we went to the vets. But, but now we've been lucky to have a couple of uh, legacies and, and at the moment, we're okay. Honestly, how long's a piece of string, basically? Uh, I could take a cat in, they all go to the vet to get checked before we rehome them but it could be out again within a week to a new home if uh, you know if it was healthy and the home was right or I could have a cat for three or four months, particularly the difficult ones. Again, it all depends age-wise, has a lot to do with it because obviously the majority of people want young cats, especially if they've got a young family, which is you know fine, but of course then you, you can get retired couples that obviously want a slightly older cats, so that's great. This is Hector and he was found collapsed on an allotment, um, very weak, starving. 
So we've had him about five weeks. He's been to the vets. He's been on steroids and antibiotics. And we're trying to build him up so that he can have his teeth done uh, because they're in a very bad state. So it just remains to be seen whether we can put enough weight on him to actually get, get his, his dental done. This year alone, I've rehomed 54 kittens. And that's just me. Probably Pat, my colleagues, has done exactly the same, if not more. That's a lot of kittens. Those kittens, if they're not spayed, they can come into season, the domestic ones, two or three times a year, and they can have five or six kittens in a litter. And that's how it just goes on and on and on. So much so that um, that's why we get all the ferals. Ferals are very difficult to home, if at all. Cats that are born outside and are basically wild. It's a nice way of putting them that they're wild cats. But we do try and get them into, if not a home, a farmer, or there's got a, a nice farm um, that will look after them, not just be rat catchers, but really look after them. That's the ideal situation for a feral cat, as far as we're concerned. If you can pick ferals up when they're kittens up to about, oh, I don't know, six, seven weeks, there's a good chance you can domesticate them. You can bring them round so they can go as a normal household cat, basically. But after that, it's very, very difficult. What is the hardest type of cat to rehome? The majority of cats that hang around the longest are black cats and tabby cats. A lot of people do phone up and you say, basically, you're asking, would they like a male or a female or do they mind? And I say, well, have you got anything in mind? Which obviously I need to know. And the, when the feedback comes, no, not really, but not a black. And I just, and I, I, I'm not, I'm never rude to people, believe you me. And I just say, oh, why? Oh, it's just something about black cats. Yes, we don't mind black cats, do we? <laughs> they don't get rehomed as quickly as some of the other coloured cats. Adult black cats, adult tabby cats hang around the longest. I think adult black cats have always been synonymous with evil and bad luck. So unfortunately, they don't get as homed as quickly as some of the others. Tabby cats, quite often long haired and they can come with their own problems and people are perhaps a little bit more reluctant to take on a cat that might need grooming every day, for example. So we tend to find, and that's quite clear here in the pods, that they're the cats that hang around the longest. Uh, kittens get picked up quite quickly, so if we get some kittens, they'll come in here to the hospital, if there's nothing wrong with them, they'll go to rehoming centre, they'll be out as soon as they're eligible, usually within weeks and sometimes reserved before that, particularly if they're a different colour, white or blue or a silver colour or something like that. We have waiting lists, literally waiting lists for kittens, they go very quickly, which is lovely, you know, it's, it's nice, but of course the older ones, they take the back burner, then nobody, they just pass them, they want kittens, kittens. So two have been reserved, and I've got a lady coming to have a look at the other two, and their claws are very sharp. Because you know they can't retract their claws till they're six months old. I just don't know how to do it. So that's the only thing that I have, I don't have a problem, but I do warn the parents, um, obviously for children picking them up, kittens, that they're not scratching them and being a nasty it's just that they cannot retract their claws so they will get sometimes scratched different dads different dads yeah right. what okay. what happens when a queen comes into season she normally it's a, it normally lasts for about five five days now during that five days she can actually be impregnated by five six different males all different colors not fussy <laughs> during the kitten season we're talking between March through to October. That's the real kitten season. That's when we're getting all the queens in, pregnant ones, some already with kittens. This is Phoebe and she came to me and she was pregnant and her owners could no longer afford to keep her, unfortunately. And she had four beautiful kittens who've all gone to new homes now. She's been spayed and she's ready for a new home, but nobody's wanted her yet. She's three. And people in the summer and the autumn tend just to want kittens most of the time. So once all the kittens have gone, which is about now, then they'll all begin taking slightly older cats. So she will, she will get a good home. 
No, the oldest one I've got would be Onji, who is 15. Um, but hopefully we we'll get him a home, which I was expecting to keep these for, for months, basically. But this lovely lady has phoned me up. Um, she's in her 80s, so she obviously doesn't want to uh, catch to outlive her, basically. He would be my, my eldest. A few years ago, we had a Siamese cat come in who has just gone 20. A lady did actually come and take her, had a Siamese all her life, just wanted a one for a companion and she took her and she lived to nearly 23 so it, it, it is really quite amazing you know um, I say there are some lovely lovely people out there that will take them on we have one Penn who is quite an elderly boy here it's a lovely boy but what we do in a case of, of, of Penn and cats like him that are old and they do need medication for the rest of their lives, basically. So rather than stay in a cattery for the rest of their lives, which is cruel, we certainly wouldn't put them down, um, unless of course they were in pain. So we get fosterers. Now fosterers will take them in as their own, basically. I mean, majority of them will, you know, obviously give them their own food, etc., pay for that. Um, but any medical bills or any problems, the charity, Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue, we will fund. But anyway, once the kittens go, the older ones get homed. But we have had cats in here really over a year. Nobody's taken them. They might be a little bit feral, which are very difficult to home, as you can imagine. But it's amazing. It's like out of the blue somebody will come and say oh it doesn't matter you know you know I've got time I can spend with them um, doesn't matter if they're frightened or a bit aggressive I'll work on them and touch wood you know these these lovely people do come along and take them to bring them in and to be rehomed we could do it within a week up to gone a year that's how it varies we do obviously stay in touch with them an awful lot I mean Obviously, once they get a cat from us, um, we will say, you know, would you mind phoning us, letting us know how it settled in. We had that very personal relationship because we're not turning over hundreds of cats all the time. We, we, we keep in contact with people. So that, again, as you say, it's a very personal thing, which I'm sure all the, the bigger organisations are fine, but the, the amount of animals they rehome, they could not possibly have the personal intervention that we have. Yes, there are some very, very strange people that treat them like little ornaments, little things, you know. We get lots of calls and sometimes in the middle of the night. I had one lady call me the other day and she said, um, I've got a bird in my garden, it can't fly, it's been there all day. So I said to her, this is cat rescue, but she took no notice and she carried on and she said, um, it's sitting there and I know it can't fly. So I asked, could she pick it up, put it, put it in a box and take it to the local rescue? And she said, oh, I'm not touching that. It's got, it's got germs. And she said, anyway, it's been sitting there all day looking at me and it's pissing me off. So sometimes I do lose patience with people, but I looked through my book and I gave her the number of a man that rescues birds. Yeah, um, there was an incident it was probably about six years ago now, where a gen gentleman, he phoned up for, um, to find out if we'd got kittens. And I said, yes, we, obviously we, we have kittens at the moment. He said, I want one for my daughter. I said, yeah, that's not a problem, but we do like them to bring their children with them, you see. So I said, said would you like to make a point to bring your daughter along? And he said, um, yes, I'll do that. He said, just can I ask you a question first before I come along? I said, yes, of course you can. He said, um, my daughter does get bored with things very, very quickly with her dolls and things like that. He said, so it may be a few months later when we've got the kitten that she'll be bored with it. Would it be possible to bring it back? I was speechless. I mean, I couldn't even answer him. I just put the phone down. There is, there is an understanding essentially that 
Um, although you've adopted the cat, the cat really always belongs to the RSPCA. So if you have any problems, whether your circumstances change, you can no longer afford to look after it, or uh, you become sick or injured, you could of course contact us and we can take the cat back in. Um, but we do like to think of it as a forever home and we're not going to interfere. So we don't check up. We, I mean, we re rehome so many animals. We'd love to be able to do that. We just don't have the, the time or the, the resources to do that, unfortunately. And then you get the threatening calls. Like I've got this cat that I don't want anymore. I need it homed like now. And you say, well, yes, we do have a waiting list, but you know, can I take your details when we're coming back to you. No, I mean, cause people can be really nasty. Um, we want, I want it gone, it's got to go. And I said, well, I, we'll do our best as quickly as we possibly can. Um, well, if you can't do anything, I'm going to get rid of it. Um, you just don't know what they're going to do or take it to a wood and leave it or take it to the vets and have it put to sleep. It's almost that they've got a gun at your head and they're, they're th they are threatening you. And it's awful because you can't do anything about it and you think, are they really going to do this? Or, you know, or are they just saying it because they want their cat, you know, homed? Both Pat and I have been threatened this year with our lives. Can you believe that? This young guy phoned me up soon after Pat, apparently, saying that, um, He'd got this cat. He said, it's um, very ill. I said, well, what, what's wrong with it? He said, well, again, crazy man. He said, um, my friend here said that if you, if you throw a cat out of a window, it will fall on its four paws. He said, but it didn't. He said, so I think its neck's broken. I said, what earth would you do something like that for? So he said, um, well, you need to come and get it. I said, to be honest, if it's broken its neck, it wouldn't be alive. He said, well, it is alive. And he started to laugh. And I said, you really are quite a sick individual. But it's frightening because he said, I know where you are. I know where you live. And you don't know if they really do or not. So he said, um, if you don't take this cat, he said, I shall come round and do the same to you, break your neck and throw you out the window. I said, well, that's very nice, isn't it? And I just put the phone down. Um, I didn't phone the police, but Pat apparently did because he more or less said the same thing to her. And they did take it very seriously. And they knew who it was um, because he obviously was a bit of a mental state. But it is unnerving. It is a, it's not so much for myself. I've had a good life. I don't, well, I don't be thrown out the window, but I've had my life. But it's wondering what they could do if they know where you are. Not so much for, for me, but what they could do to the, to, to the animals. Because if they're a sick individual like that, how far do they go? You know, it's, it's, it's horrible. So we put up with quite a few things. It makes, makes life interesting, I'll say that. Unfortunately, there's a growing minority of people who choose to abuse and abandon their pets just because that animal no longer fits in with their lifestyle that a member of public would report an incident of animal cruelty on any type of animal. And if that report fitted into the postcodes that I was responsible for, that incident would be sent to me and I'd have to go along and knock on the door and find out as much as I could about that allegation. Despite recent legislation, this does not deter some sick people and animal abuse is still with us. Recently, an owner told an RSPCA inspector that she didn't take her cat to a vet after it had been shot in the eye, preferring to self-medicate the feline and was justifiably prosecuted as the cat was in pain. We're a police officer for animals, yeah, I do describe, certainly to children who don't understand what we do, that's what I say, I, you know, police officers look after people and I'm a police officer looking after the animals, yes. You know, poor little dumb animals, they don't deserve half what they, uh what they you know get from 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 humans it's it's cruel we had a um a beautiful long-haired tabby when we first started actually he had literally been kicked around a field like a football when he came in he was a huge cat when he came in 
his jaw was just broken in so many places, you would be, his eye was gushed in. Um, they'd done horrible things to him all over his body. Anyway, obviously we, we took him to the vet and they wired the jaw up. For about three months, I was uh, like a little dropper feeding him because he couldn't, couldn't swallow properly, but he turned into the most wonderful, loving, handsome cat. He really did. Got a home for him, lovely girl, and she used to take him everywhere in her car. I used to sit in the front with her and take her he used to, all over the place. She used to take him. So he got a wonderful life. But that's another incident. People don't realise how cruel people can be to animals. Oh, and I, I don't understand their mentality. Why do they do this sort of thing to animals? It, it, I can't say it's sick, because if I said it's sick, my grandchildren would say to me, sick now, Nana, is good. Did you know that? There's two, <laughs> I can't keep out of the youngsters. Sick is good, so, but it's not, it's, it's really bad. So I don't know, I don't know, I give up. That's why we like animals so much. I can, I can relate to them. <laughs> uh, we do work with young offenders um, particularly those that have had some um, animal welfare issues possibly. We have a lot of volunteers that are um, wanting to get back into work so they're using volunteer work as an excellent way of putting that on their CV and we actively encourage that. Uh, new wildlife casualty volunteers want to come and get some training because they might want to come and be inspectors or animal collection officers or animal welfare officers. So we do target the, the younger generations, if you like, because we believe that grassroots is where education starts. The Animal Welfare Act of 2007 is an important piece of legislation because pet owners can no longer abandon their animals. And if found guilty, they could face a £20,000 fine or a year in prison. Prior to this new act, the law was generally reactive intervening only when an animal was mistreated, whereas the 2007 Act imposes a duty of care, not just to pet owners, but also breeders alike. Obviously I've been quite lucky in my career that the Animal Welfare Act came in over the um, sorry, Protection of Animals Act 1911, which has meant that we've been able to, to be more proactive and I think that's really where the RSPCA is strong, is the proactive work, it's the education. The P in RSPCA is prevention, it's not for prosecution. So we are there to educate the ignorant about how to look after their animals. And we do do that and we do achieve that. And we certainly see, although the crime figures, if you like, and the prosecution figures are still quite high, um, they don't spike, they don't rise massively. You know, we are, those people that have committed those horrendous crimes will always commit those horrendous crimes. But we are making more of an impact where it counts. So the RSPCA's New Generation Kind programme, for example, is, means that we can get in there talking to children, talking to the grassroots, getting them educated. And I've certainly seen more of that, people certainly becoming more environmentally aware generally we're, in, we're aware that you know, polar bears don't have any ice to stand on and grizzly bears are starving and that, that there are cats that are abandoned, puppy farms. It's certainly become much more, I think because social media has made it much more accessible for everybody as well, hasn't it? People can see those images and, and find out for themselves really what's going on. I think that's certainly in my 16 years I've seen it's become much more, people have become much more knowledgeable about animal cruelty in general and therefore animal welfare. There are 40 different cat breeds and breeders should be registered with the governing council of the cat fancy or abbreviated GCCG which means it is illegal to sell a kitten without the proper inoculation procedures and this can't be any earlier than 13 weeks unfortunately there are many backstreet breeders out there who operate irresponsibly, such as keeping a litter in a cold environment, like a shed, and breeding many times from the same queen. Prospective kitten owners should always see the litter that their kitten has come from, and most importantly, see its interaction with its mother.
Illegal breeding of, of all animals is certainly on the rise because there's money in it. So we're all very much aware of puppy farming and, and particularly at certain times of year, the explosion in puppies that come through that are sick and poorly because they've not been bred properly. They're in barns in Ireland and Wales and actually here even here in London in people's high rise blocks. The illegal breeding of cats is something that's much more difficult to pin down. I've got kittens now that somebody bought. I thought that they were eight or nine weeks old and found out they were only five. They weren't old enough to leave their mother, but what people do is they breed them. As soon as they can feed on their own, they sell them because they want the money and they continue to do this. And I'm sure a lot of the kittens die because they're interbred. They keep breeding from the same male and female. It's, it's just a sad situation. Can't quite see how it's going to end. Majority of stray cats and kittens have come about as a result of people possibly abandoning them or people die and unfortunately their animals are just left out on the streets. Those animals then do get pregnant and go home and people don't want those kittens or as you quite rightly said they don't want the black one because they can't sell the black one on Google or pets for homes or whatever it is you're selling on the internet but they've managed to sell the white one, they've managed to sell the stripy one um, and then they get abandoned. So certainly the the not so much the illegal breeding of cats, but the, just the unconditional, uncontrolled breeding of cats is, yeah, that, there's always an explosion of that where people just don't neuter their animals for all sorts of reasons. They claim they can't afford to, even though the RSPCA and most of the other organisations that you've mentioned will offer free or certainly reduced neutering programmes. Religious grounds, we hear that quite a lot, that people won't neuter their animals, particularly cats on religious grounds. And cats can produce two or three litters of up to eight to ten cats a year. That's a huge amount of animals suddenly just out in the population that people can't sell, can't get rid of, don't want, can't give away. Then they just get dumped. I honestly don't think it can be pleased. There's too much of it going on. Uh, unless anybody reports these people, and it's usually has to be the RSPCA that take action because obviously we haven't got the, the legal right to, um, then they're not stopped. And I think that the RSPCA are probably inundated with so many complaints that they just can't keep up with it all. Of course, there are many legitimate and good breeders out there as well. Breeding, breeding the abbeys was lovely. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I say, obviously, we, we were travelling an awful lot all the time, every fortnight, we go to shows and things. That was great. But um, I think it might have been, I don't know, maybe on television or in the papers about all these cats unwanted um, and a lot of them have been put to sleep. And you just see, uh, to me, the domestic cat is just as lovely as, as a pedigree. I, I honestly, well, obviously I've got one of each anyway, but there's so many breeders about, let, let's leave this and concentrate on the, on the rescues pedigrees that you're introducing, the less chance a little domestic would have a home for. But I think it's balanced out quite well now. I've got nothing against the pedigrees, don't get me wrong. And there's some lovely breeders out there, but there are some that just do it, you know, for the finance, which I don't think is a good thing. They used to say, and probably there's a lot of truth in this, that the pedigree probably aren't as strong, as health-wise I'm talking about, as your domestic. But there are certain breeds, like one, the Abyssinian, for instance, they're a very strong breed. They probably don't live as long. I mean, obviously your little domestics, they can live 20 plus years quite, quite easily. And, and again, it all depends. Do you want to breed from them or, or not? We don't agree on, obviously, um, the ones that we rehome here to go to breed in stock. That's why we do more or less get them to sign a form, the owners to be, to say that they will get them spayed and neutered at five and a half months. For all their differences, the RSPCA and smaller charities like the Margie Nash Cat Rescue Centre often work hand in hand to rescue animals. We certainly don't consider any other animal welfare organisation a competitor. We work very closely with all of those organisations. I think the only thing that makes the RSPCA different is officers like myself. So it's the prosecution side that we're involved in that all the other, other agencies are not. 
That doesn't mean to say they don't help us do that, they do. Quite often they'll report matters to us that they're not happy about. If we bring animals into our centre that we don't have the room or the expertise for, we might pass them on to an organisation that does. There are certain parts of the law that says, for example, if somebody is arrested, uh, that animal would have to go to Battersea Dogs Home because they're responsible for prisoners' property and the RSPCA are not. But we certainly don't compete with each other. We all have a particular niche, if you like, but we're all working towards the benefit of animal welfare, that's for sure. A lot of the charities, you can't just phone up like people do us constantly. A lot of the bigger organisations, you have to go online and there's a form apparently that comes up and you have to fill the form in. That's why you could even go and see a cat. And then if you pass that form, they will notify you and say, yes, you are allowed to come and, and see. So uh, we do it in a, a much simpler way. And to be honest, especially the older people, I don't know, like me, I'm not very good on the computers. They just think, oh no, I'm not doing that. So that suits them a lot better than actually if they could just phone me up and I say, yes, pop over such and such a time. So many people, when they phone up, it's so nice to hear a human voice, you know, rather than and talk to somebody. It's that personal sort of feeling that, you know, people like and hopefully we, we give to them, yeah. None of our um, trustees or anybody in the Marjorie Nash Cat Rescue is paid. So that means that any money we have is spent completely on the cats, which unlike obviously the bigger organisations, they have paid staff, uh, premises that they have office staff because they're much bigger organisations and they need it. So all our money just goes to the cats. That's one difference. Um, the other difference is that we have our own rules and maybe we don't have to be quite as strict about some things as the bigger organisations might have to be because there's just a small number of us and we decide between ourselves. Apart from that, I don't think there's much difference. It's just you know, taking in cats and rehoming them to good homes. So the RSPCA staff generally, not just frontline, everyone back behind the scenes, everyone at HQ, is all focused towards that animal welfare, but we do it quite differently from the other organisations in that respect. Marjorie was on, on one of the committees of the RSPCA and she just disagreed with some of their policies and thought that she would start her own charity up which she did um, and you know how many cats has she saved in all the years since she started it up it's marvelous really so it even though we're small everybody knows that if they ring us we will try and place a cat like the vets always ring us whereas some of the big organizations because they have so many rules can't take them we might find an individual fosterer to take a cat from the vets that's been handed in until we have space for it in the catery. Whereas I think some of the bigger organisations wouldn't allow that. You can't really compare us to them. They do wonderful jobs, don't get me wrong, they, they do, but we do it our way, they do it their way. And that's, but saying that, I mean, we do work quite closely with them, or they with us, to be honest, because we get phone calls from the RSPCA, from the CPL, from the Blue Cross, because they are full and they phone us and say, oh yes, oh yes, can you help? We've got this cat or we've got these kittens that have come in. Would you be able to help? And if we've got the room, we will take them in. So we, you know, it's not them and us. It's never the other way round though. It's not us phone them, it's always they phone us. So I suppose that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We're happy the way we are. I, well, we couldn't expand anymore. We haven't got the, the people that would uh, help us, you know. I find that every time we have publicity out of the area, it just results in more calls for us to take cats in from a wider area. <laughs> it would be nice if it resulted in some more donations so that we could take more cats in. But, you know, a, a newspaper asked us to put an advert in, which we did, and we just got more and more calls to take cats in from that area. So in a way we cannot cut we can't cope with other areas we have to stick within our area because we haven't got the capacity to take uh, cats from other areas uh, I mean I think you might have heard earlier that we Cindy had two cats dumped on her drive one night somebody had driven from London to dump them there because they'd they'd seen the name spoken to Cindy thought she sounded kind even though she told them she didn't have room 
driven from London and dump them on her drive at night. So yeah, that's what publicity does for us. <laughs> we used to advertise in local papers, but it costs so much money. It costs so much, we just couldn't afford it. Whereas the bigger you are, you get all these freebies thrown in, but of course we don't, you see, and um, we just couldn't, couldn't go along with that. But we, we do very well, thank you, <laughs> so. Right, I would say to them, think ahead, okay? Obviously people want to go on holiday, they go away, there's business. When you think ahead like that, is there somebody that can, or would somebody look after that cat? Or if it's an elderly person, which I know we do, we're all getting older, but you know, a lot of quite elderly people, they do phone up and they ask for kittens. Now we have to be very, well, careful what we say to them, but what we try and say to them is, just in case a cat outlived you, which is a possibility it is, would there be somebody to take that cat on? And if there isn't, then we just say, it's probably not the best thing. Would you like a slightly older cat? You get an elderly person that's a little bit dodgy on their legs anyway. They could fall over and give themselves a really, really nasty accident. So we have to think of them as well. Give them a little bit of advice without being rude. It's all very nice having a nice little kitten running around, but they grow up in a few months to be an adult cat. They need care. We like to think that when we rehome a cat or kitten here, they are going to be part of somebody's family, not just a cat that comes in, you feed it, and it goes out. We want them to be part of a family and, you know, to, to think ahead like that, as if they are a family member, basically, yeah. I will carry on as long as I can possibly get out of bed and walk down the stairs and, and, and get into the cattery. At the moment, the money isn't a problem because I think I said to you, we've had a couple of legacies left us and this will probably carry on because people know us and they do tell us that we're in their wills, which is brilliant. So at the moment, the money isn't the problem uh, and we have some very generous donations. It's just really the youth. <laughs> But is there anybody for after we've finished, will they take over from us? It's a big commitment for anybody young with a family to take over because they haven't got the time to do it. Uh, we have had volunteers and they're fine for a little while and then they realise the work involved and, and they don't want to carry on. So we do need to get some, some younger people to take over from Cindy and I when we can't do it anymore. We would do our damnedest, but what will happen in I don't know, five, ten years, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think, to be honest, the Marjorie Nash rescue will be here, unfortunately. No, I don't. But we just have to, we live for day to day and that's all we can do. I, I have a friend in Cats Protection and, and they've done that recently, set two small catteries up in people's gardens. One girl's done it for a year and then said she doesn't want to do it anymore. And, and the other one's taking a sabbatical and doesn't want to do it. So they've spent thousands of pounds on catteries for, for a year. You, you've got to be careful who, who, who does it for you, really. Maybe somebody out there will, uh, will take us on. I, I don't know, we'll just see. I mean, there are some very, very kind people, but um, it's, it's frightening. And of course, you see, unfortunately, the way we are today, people losing jobs all the time. What suffers with anything is the pet. You know, it's the first thing that has to go. Um, you know, they need a roof over their head, but perhaps they can't afford to keep a cat or a dog or any, any pet. So, you know, that's happening all the time. And it is, I mean, yes, of course you feel so sorry for people that have been made redundant and things, but my mind, and I know it shouldn't, it obviously thinks for the family, but I think, oh God, if they're going to have, if they've got pets, what's going to, who's going to look after the pets? That's how you, you begin to think. I know I shouldn't, but I do. <laughs> but yeah, the same as these fires and things like that. You, it's not that I don't like humans, I do, honestly, but I do love my animals. So what does the future hold for people working in animal rescue centres? 
I think certainly the bigger will get richer and the poorer will get poorer. I don't want to think too far into the future, quite honestly, it upsets me a bit. But uh, we do what we can. <laughs>